Hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming, um, especially to our participants, because I know I have already put you all through so much, and I really appreciate you coming out again tonight to see how it's all going. Um, so I work at the Brain Research Institute. I returned from London, I don't know, three or four years ago now, and was really lucky to come back on board the clinic that helped me get my PhD. So I'm really excited to be back and especially excited to be working on a earthquake project when I was here for the Canterbury earthquakes and I just feel it's really important research that needs to be done. So we're very grateful to the Neurological Foundation for funding it and grateful for the support of everybody else that continues to support it. So without further ado, we are going to look at some earthquake brain stuff this evening. So I'm sure I don't need to remind really any of you here about the 22nd of February and what an awful day that was for everybody that lived in Canterbury, Canterbury but also wider New Zealand. And unfortunately the 22nd wasn't even the start of it because of course September was our first major event but the 22nd was when we had the greatest tragedy. And we're unfortunately still seeing a lot of long term effects of that, some of which I'll go into this evening. So as well as the destruction to our infrastructure and our livelihoods and our families and really everything and our ongoing roadworks and our ongoing EQC battles and our ongoing insurance dramas, what we also started to see in the years following the earthquakes was an enormous increase in mental health crises. So a lot of these articles are from 2016, which is a good four to five years since the earthquake happened and that's when we started really noticing a major problem. So, <coughs> sorry, the media started reporting on diagnosed mood and anxiety disorders increasing. Radio New Zealand picked up on some DHB research that uh, had the very comforting headline that we were sitting on a mental health time bomb, basically just waiting for things to get worse until we could no longer handle it. At the same time, we were seeing headlines like this almost every day, at least weekly, coming out of Christchurch about people's battles with EQC, about their battles with insurance, about their loss of jobs and their loss of their relationships and their increased diagnoses of disorders of the psychiatric nature as well as the physical nature. So expanding on some of this uh, newspaper reporting was some DHB research. So this was published in 2016 that the proportion of people reporting that they felt stressed almost always, all of the time, doubled. So it was only at 8% in Canterbury residents pre-earthquakes and it hit almost 20% in 2015, four years after the major earthquakes. In the months prior to that, attempted suicides increased 60% compared to pre-quake levels. Unsurprisingly, these were the highest in New Zealand. 37% increase in people entering mental health services. This is shocking for a number of reasons, but mainly that it's very difficult to be admitted to mental health services. You have to be in quite a bad way to be admitted. So a 37% increase in admissions is shocking. Rural mental health presentations went up 65% because rural people already suffer from an enormous amount of stress. Emergency health presentations went up 104% and emergency psych assessments, 124%. So this is already quite a grim picture for Canterbury five years post-earthquake when most people would be expecting that we'd just got over it and moved on with it. So at about the same time, I think this was published in 2014, um, the Department of Psychological Medicine at the University of Targo, based in town near the hospital, they started doing some research on post-earthquake people. And PsychNet's really quite proactive on this sort of thing. They also run the Christchurch Health and Development Study. This is a really valuable study for research. It's taken people since they were born and followed them on various bits and pieces throughout their lives. So at the time of the earthquakes, I think these people were about 30. They were 35 when they were assessed by PsychNet post-earthquake. And what they were asked to do is they were asked to rank their level of earthquake exposure. So for example, how bad had the earthquake affected them? Had they lost their livelihoods? Had they lost a loved one? Had they lost their house? And then, Psychmed looked at some of the outcomes from 
hey laser, some of the outcomes associated with this. So what we're looking at here in this graph, if we just focus on the very dark bar, the very dark bar is people that were categorised as, you've had quite a terrible time, I'm sorry, you, this earthquake has impacted you quite a lot. And so the very dark bar is always higher, and the reason it's higher is because on the y-axis here is what we call an association score. So the higher the score, the stronger the association. So in this first little part here, there's a very high association with major depression. So people that had had quite a terrible time as the result of the earthquakes had a very high association with major depression. Same thing over here with other anxiety disorders. People that had had quite a terrible time were more likely to have high anxiety problems. The pattern repeats with nicotine dependence, alcohol dependence, illicit drug abuse and dependence, other unclassified psychiatric disorders and suicide attempts. So things were not going very well in Canterbury. The same people from PsychMed also sat down and they looked at all the studies that had been conducted since the earthquake. So we kind of call this a meeting about meetings. Lots of other people have done research and then someone sits down and looks through all of that research and sort of tries to get an overall conclusion. Say, so let's have a look at how good this research is and what it's actually telling us overall. So this meeting, about all these meetings, was on 20 studies. Of these 20 studies, the majority reported negative consequences in people living in Canterbury as a direct result of the earthquakes. The majority of studies reported greater negative consequences associated with the degree of exposure. So basically, the more terrible your time was, the worse off you were which if you think about it is unsurprising. But the thing about research is quite a lot of it is common sense. But we need the research to back that up to help with policy and planning and funding. So a lot of these meetings, about these meetings, were conducted within two years of the earthquakes. <coughs> Sorry, that was, turns out that was backwards. At the same time, in about 2015, 2016, Christchurch got dealt another blow and we were assigned much less funding for mental health and treatment than we were expecting. So unfortunately, just because of the way the cookie crumbled, we ended up with a $23 million shortfall in 20, the 2015-2016 year. And the DHB isn't a bad person. They said, don't worry, we're going to obviously try and make up this shortfall from somewhere, but at the same time, we were dealing with trying to repair broken buildings and trying to earthquake strengthen existing buildings. So what we had at this point was quite a terrible picture of Canterbury's mental health, mostly undiagnosed, and also a huge decrease in funding. So what are the implications of this? I mean, clearly this isn't good, is it? But up until then, we had quite a lot of difficulty with the unawareness that you can have psychological difficulties that don't meet threshold. So you don't need to have post-traumatic stress disorder, you don't need to have an anxiety disorder, you don't need to have depression, but you can still be having significant emotional difficulties. Unfortunately, this isn't routinely screened for. This is not something that your GP will sit down and ask you about. If you don't meet threshold for clinical symptoms, you're unlikely to be able to be picked up by GP services and it's additionally difficult to detect. They may understand that you're suffering some level of difficulty, but not be able to categorise it. Adding to this is people just exposed to stress without any other comorbidities are more likely to have cardiovascular difficulties, so more likely to have increased heart rate and other heart complications when they're exposed to trauma reminders which is obviously quite a problem in a city that experiences a lot of aftershocks. Adding to this, they are more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder if they're exposed to subsequent trauma. So now we're sitting on a city that has significant undetected clinical, almost clinical level psychological difficulties who are more likely to experience problems later. So let's take a closer look at what might be happening here. So this is a very simplistic example of our threat processing response. So 
when there's something like the earthquake, our sensory system takes in all the information that the earthquake is providing us. It takes in the sound, it takes in the feelings, and it takes in every other piece of information it can get its hands on. That sensory system then works to decide what the appropriate emotional response is. Now for most people experiencing an earthquake, the automatic emotional response is one of fear. This is not something we are going to enjoy. So then our fear response, the behavioural response of the emotional response, is dive under the nearest table or run away, depending on your situation, of course. It's a very simplistic version of our threat processing response. We see a threat, our sensory system reacts, we experience fear, and then we develop the appropriate behaviour in response to that. What can happen is a hyperactive response to threat. So again, we experience the threat. So for example, the earthquake, the sensory system goes into absolute overdrive. We experience fear, and then we have the appropriate behavioral response. The reason this happens is, is because our brains are really clever. So our brain knows that the earthquake is something that causes fear, and we need to have the appropriate behavioral response. The problem is, aftershock after aftershock after aftershock is teaching our brain that the earthquake is bad, it makes us scared, and we need to fear fearful of this. And this is what's called a hyperactive response to threat. And I mean, to be honest, it's not terrible. I mean, you don't want to be sitting there complacently about an earthquake as the building is falling around you. You definitely need to react to that. The issue is, is when this becomes maladaptive, so it's totally fine to experience fear when there's an aftershock. When it goes wrong is when there's increased attention to threat. So how many of you in this room have experienced a truck go rumbling past your office or your home? And how many of you have your sensory system thought that was an earthquake? That's an increased attention to threat. There we go, I've just diagnosed you all with an increased attention to threat. Should see someone about that. <laughs> so what's happening when the truck goes past is that our sensory system is experiencing an earthquake. It's hearing the truck and thinking, earthquake. It's feeling the rumble and thinking, that's an earthquake. And so then your body's going, scared now, that's an earthquake. And you're trying to run away. I've run into a doorway when it's been a truck. And you feel ridiculous, but it's just your brain responding in the way that it's designed to do. So our increased attention to threat is slightly problematic. So if we break this down a little bit further into less of a cartoon brain, you can see that if a person is looking this way, the same way as me, nose, eyes, prefrontal cortex, this is the front of the brain. So when that earthquake or that truck is coming past, it's your prefrontal cortex that's reacting. It's saying, all right, let's have a look at my environmental cues. What's happening here? I'm going to decide what to do about it. Your amygdala, which is what we call the basic emotional processing system, this is deep in the limbic system in this part of the brain. It's a tiny little structure. It's your amygdala that's freaking out. It's your amygdala that's scared. It wants you to run away when it sees the truck. It is not having a good time. The third component that we're going to talk about tonight is the hippocampus, and that's our little memory center. So between the amygdala and the memory center, the amygdala is feeling scared in response to the noise and the feelings of the truck, and the hippocampus is remembering that. So when this whole system breaks down, that's when we get disrupted threat processing. When disrupted threat processing is really bad, that's when we get post-traumatic stress disorder. Nearly everything we know about threat processing has come from post-traumatic stress disorder studies. So post-traumatic stress disorder first came out of the world wars when veterans were returning home and they were just not well. They might have been physically well or they might have adapted to their injuries but they were not coping mentally with anything. They were having reactions to doors slamming. They weren't sleeping, they weren't coping with stressful events, and they were just clearly not well. And that's when post-traumatic stress disorder was first diagnosed. So lots of research came out of that, <clears throat> but it is basically underlied by disrupted threat processing to a maladaptive level. So if we break this down even further, what is happening specifically in the brain when you have disrupted threat processing? 
Now this slice of the brain, if you pretend that you've chopped my head in half this way, you're essentially looking at the brain just like this. So this top bit here is also the frontal bit on the side here. And this helpful arrow is important to this little blob, which is a lit up amygdala. So this is an example of a brain scan of a group of people with post-traumatic stress disorder. So they've got really bad disruptive threat processing. And what we know from these functional imaging studies is that in people with terrible threat processing, the prefrontal cortex, this part that's supposed to be modulating the environment, that's basically not working as well as it should be. That's hearing the truck and instead of saying to the amygdala, it's okay, calm down, it's just a truck. It's going, that's not good, that's not good. We need to get out of here. The amygdala is also not playing its part. So that's the part that decides whether we're scared or not. And in disrupted threat processing, the amygdala is really scared. The amygdala hears the truck and is really scared. So the amygdala is really scared, huge activation in the amygdala, and it's not being modulated by the prefrontal cortex like it should be. Additionally, the hippocampus, so the final part of our fair circuitry model, is also not playing its part. So now it's remembering all the stuff it's not supposed to remember. It's remembering the noise and the grumbling of the truck, when really it shouldn't even remember that that's a threat. So essentially, disrupted threat processing and post-traumatic stress disorder the whole system is not reacting how it should. Now you're wondering, why on earth are you talking to me about post-traumatic stress disorder? None of us are that bad. We're fine. We know it's a truck. The problem is, because of all this mental health crises in Christchurch and this decreased funding, we're really pushing to get recognition that things are going on when you're just exposed to trauma. You don't have to have post-traumatic stress disorder. You don't have to have diagnosed anxiety. You don't have to have a diagnosed emotional disorder. We think you still have disrupted threat processing. So it's really important to understand the effects of just going through the earthquakes without any other issues. We think this is absolutely vital for understanding post-trauma cognition. So all the complications that arise out of trauma, we really think it's quite important to understand them in our Christchurch sample. As an added bonus, investigating trauma also gives you some insight into how post-traumatic stress disorder might develop. So ideally, if the ethics committees weren't a factor that we had to liaise with, what we would want to do was expose a whole lot of people to trauma. We would then want half of them to develop post-traumatic stress disorder and then we would want half of them who were perfectly matched on age and sex and everything else that's important in research, we would want them not to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. And what this would allow, it would allow us to measure the effect of post-traumatic stress disorder. So this line is, you've been through the earthquakes, you've developed post-traumatic stress disorder, let's see what the effect of post-traumatic stress disorder is. And then this line is, you've been through the earthquakes, you haven't developed post-traumatic stress disorder. Let's see what the effect of the trauma is. So what has the earthquake done to your brain without you having post-traumatic stress disorder? And because we like research and we like things to be very expensive instead of just a little bit expensive, we also want another group who have been through no trauma and they act as our control group. So what does a normal brain look like compared to these people who have been through trauma but don't have PTSD? and these people who do have PTSD. So in about, I don't know, 2015, 2016, there was a couple of more serious meetings about meetings. And a couple of quite well-known researchers sat down and went through all the post-traumatic stress disorder studies, and they came up with a basic conclusion about what was actually going on. So in the meetings about meetings, there was about maybe 50 studies of people that have disrupted threat processing compared to people who didn't. But these studies were different because of their control groups. So some of their control groups had been through trauma and some of their control groups hadn't. And this gave us really valuable insight into the effect of post-traumatic stress disorder on the brain or the effect of just trauma. So what they concluded, basically, is that in people who have been exposed to trauma, so people like you, people like me, we've been through the earthquakes, no post-traumatic stress disorder, there's reduced activation in this region, 
So remember this region is responsible for deciding whether we're scared of the truck or not. And so this region, who should be saying, calm down, it's okay, it's just a truck, isn't. And this is just people that have been through trauma. Additionally, the second part of this fear circuitry model is the amygdala, and that's the emotional processing center that decides of, on the fear levels. So the amygdala is activated in the people with the PTSD, which is what you expect. The amygdala is not working in people with PTSD, but it's only significantly different when it's compared to people who haven't been through trauma. There is no difference in the amygdala of people who have been through trauma and people that have post-traumatic stress disorder. So that fear component of your brain and my brain is just as bad in us as it is in someone with post-traumatic stress disorder. There's no diagnosis. So those were quite good meetings about meetings, those papers. Unfortunately, the way that research works is you just think you've got a great little conclusion and a nice little story and you can wrap it off and go up and have a cup of tea. No. So, there's also been some other research. So this is an example. These blue lines here are where the brain's been cut. So what you're looking at here is if the brain's been cut at the top, this is the first slice, and they just keep getting sliced until they get further and further down the brain, and this bit is the brain stem. So you're essentially looking at it top down in slices. This is the brain of people that have been through a road traffic accident. So they didn't test them to see whether they had PTSD, but they were basically subclinical. They didn't have significant issues on a whole lot of other measures. And what we're looking at is the activation in people who have been through a road traffic accident compared to people who haven't. So you can see that these blobs, essentially, are bits of the brain that are doing something different. So the people who have been through an accident, there's something different going on here when they're processing things. What they didn't find was any differences in any regions of those fear processing models. So the prefrontal cortex is fine, the amygdala is fine, the hippocampus is fine. So they essentially, this one study was trying to disprove all of the meetings about the meetings. However, they did conclude that perhaps their participants were not traumatised enough. <laughs> but they did score relatively highly on some of their trauma scales. And then, of course, there's more contradictory research. I really like this one. This is a perfect natural study. So they have a whole lot of twins, and something happened. And so t one twin had a stressful life event, and that might have been, um, for example, going to a war or having a terrible accident or witnessing a terrible thing. So just naturally, they recruited a whole lot of twins, identical, one of whom had had quite a terrible time. And what we're looking at here is the twins who have experienced this stressful event compared to the twins who have not. And again, these blobs indicate these different regions of change happening in the twins who have experienced stress. Unfortunately, not much happening in the prefrontal cortex, nothing happening in the amygdala, but there is something happening in the hippocampus. Maybe our fear circuitry model is right after all. So essentially, what we can conclude from this, basically, is the majority of research points to the fact that there are brain changes happening after trauma. Some of these are long-lasting, and some of these are quite significant. The majority of studies show they're happening in our threat processing system, so in the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. These are the same regions that are implicated very heavily in post-traumatic stress disorder. So, so we have to ask the question, should we be considering the impact of trauma on brain function, irrespective of whether people have post-traumatic stress disorder? Perhaps this is a continuum. Perhaps you just have a few changes. Perhaps you have a lot of changes. <coughs> so post-earthquake, this is the study that a lot of the participants that have been recruited for our earthquake brain study were actually originally involved in. The University of Otago Psych Med, they thought, let's start looking at threat processing. Now, originally what they were doing is they were looking at threat processing in post-traumatic stress disorder. So they had this lovely group of people with post-traumatic stress disorder, and they had a lovely group of control people who had experienced nothing adverse in their life, and they were just going about their business. 
Conveniently, or, or not, uh, we got a bit of a natural experience when this control group had to go through the earthquakes. So then what they ended up with was a group with post-traumatic stress disorder and a group who had been through trauma but did not have post-traumatic stress disorder. So now we've got that first part of that diagram, the perfect diagram of let's see what's happening in trauma without having to create it. So the facial expression task, it's a bit of a complicated one, but basically it measures threat processing. So people who have disruption to that circuitry of the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, those people who have any disruption to that system, they do not process the fearful faces, the angry faces, or the disgusted faces in the same way that people who don't have disruption. So we can use a test like this to see basically how the threat processing system is going without having to put people in an MRI scanner. So the aim of this sub-study that came out of the perfectly timed earthquake was to check if the earthquake itself, or if it was the development of post-traumatic stress disorder that was altering the threat processing in people who had been through the earthquakes. So what happens is, people who have disrupted threat processing respond more accurately to certain faces and if you remember the trucks and the increased attention to threat, this is why. So if you're seeing a sad face, someone who has disrupted threat processing will immediately recognise that faster than someone who doesn't have disrupted threat processing. And that's the same reason that our heart rate increases when we hear the truck. We think, oh gosh, is this going to be a problem? It's just the hypervigilance to threat. But because of this well-known phenomenon, it's really useful for testing things on the faces task. And what they found was, if we look at this first column here, this is the group with post-traumatic stress disorder. The one next to it is the group who have just been through the earthquakes but who have no other problems. And you can see, especially when it comes to the angry faces, is that the people with post-traumatic stress disorder and the people who have been through the earthquakes are basically responding in the exact same way to the angry faces. So the control group's fine. They don't think that the angry face is a threat at all. Their disrupted threat processing isn't a thing. But the post-traumatic stress group and the earthquake group think that that face is a threat and they are seeing it faster than anybody else. And this is consistently happening for the sad face and also the disgusted face. So it's essentially proving that there's disrupted threat processing in Canterbury people and that this is generally at the same level as post-traumatic stress disorder. So this study came out and they said, all right, people who have been through the earthquakes have hypervigilance to threat. They are seeing earthquakes when they're hearing trucks. But they don't have post-traumatic stress disorder. So because it's psychological medicine, the people that were in that study went through quite extensive, we're really sorry about that, psychiatric testing, as well as a whole lot of emotional processing, and we know they're fine. There's no issues there. There's not clinical issues there. So what we're seeing is disruptive threat processing in people that shouldn't really have it at all. And so that research came out and said, okay, we need some early evaluation here on these people that have been through this terrible time, and we need some intervention of people who have survived trauma. Not people who have survived trauma and who are experiencing difficulties, people who have survived trauma full stop. So, I came along a couple of years later and I said, oh, you've got these lovely groups and they've already been through so much. Do you think they'll have an MRI? And they said, probably not because they've already been through so much and aren't MRIs quite noisy and don't they bang and the, the hypervigilance to threat Nadia? And I was like, I'll be okay. So I'm really sorry. <laughs> and so what we wanted to do was test those two groups and see what their brains were doing. So we know there's disrupted threat processing. We saw that from the Otago study. What we then wanted to do was put these people in an MRI machine and see what their brain was doing when we stressed them out. So we wanted to compare our earthquake group, our Canterbury people, with a group who hadn't been through any trauma at all. Essentially, what we want to do is prove that something's happening in the brains and we need some help with that. 
So at the moment, our hypothesis is there will be brain changes in people who have been through the earthquakes. Our canary people are going to show brain changes. We're hoping they'll be in these threat processing regions, frontal regions, the limbic system, including the amygdala, and possibly the hippocampus. So the reason we think this might be happening is because of previous research that's been done in stress. So this isn't necessarily people who have significant stress, just stress. So these people in this study have been through what they call chronic life stress. So generally prolonged, quite awful events to the point where they've got chronic stress. And in people who've been through this level of stress, what you're seeing is changes in the limbic region. So around the amygdala, this is actually the hippocampus, but around the kind of limbic region, and a little bit of changes in the prefrontal cortex. So chronic life stress, without any other diagnoses, is indicative of some quite major structural changes. Unsurprisingly, the worse the changes are in people with stress, the more associated, the more stressed they are. The higher their stress, the worse their changes are. So we thought, okay, this is probably gonna help prove our research. Hope we can get funding for that. And then we found a study on a different earthquake. So this was an earthquake in 2008 in China. It was quite a significant one. They lost almost 90,000 people. Their homelessness was horrific. I don't know how they did this, but 13 days after this horrendous earthquake, they managed to get a whole lot of people to undergo a MRI scan. I know. It was in a university town, so I suspect there might have been some money involved, but they did it. So, and what they found very soon after the earthquake was re reduced grey matter volumes. And the grey matter is what you need for thinking. It's the bit that does all the work, really. Without grey matter, you're not going to be able to process things. So that's where your cells and your neurons and everything all gathers and does all the work. So reduced gray matter is not ideal. And they found reduced gray matter in these frontal regions, which remember are important for threat processing, and also in the limbic regions. There was also some regions of increased gray matter through here. And so they concluded that the brain was changing in regions that modulate stress very soon after the earthquake. Thankfully, three and a half years later, they did a follow-up. So we were able to look at whether this maybe be a long-lasting thing or a transient thing that just sort of goes away. So this time they compared two groups, those that were in the original group that were in the area at the time, and a control group who weren't in the area at the time. And what they found supported their original claims is that there was changes in this hippocampal amygdala region, so part of the threat processing system, changes in some frontal regions, and changes in some parietal regions, which is also mildly involved in all of that. The fact that they're reporting reduced grey matter density is quite important. It's quite hard to lose your grey matter. You've got to be having quite a lot of trouble. Normally what you see is what we call diffusion changes with a few little cellular changes, maybe a little bit of things breaking down a wee bit. Losing grey matter is difficult. So grey matter loss only three and a half years later is quite a problem. And if I remember correctly, these groups were quite young. They were in their 20s, maybe up to 25. So they shouldn't have been losing grey matter for any other re reason. So they concluded that something's going on in this threat processing system. And this is just in people who've been exposed to trauma. They had no other diagnoses. So they continued. They ran a couple of different scans. And what we're looking at here is what we call functional connectivity. So how well are two things connected? If things aren't connected very well, they're not going to communicate very well. So what you want is high functional con connectivity in things that you want to communicate. Now, if we think right back to the amygdala and the hippocampus conspiring together to remember the things like the truck. So the hippocampus is remembering that we were scared of the truck. And the amygdala is saying, hippocampus, remember, we're scared of the truck. We are scared of this truck. And what we're seeing in the people who went through the earthquakes is that they had increased functional connectivity. So probably similar to us, after lots and lots of aftershocks, your brain just keeps learning these pathways and your amygdala keeps going, hold on, we're scared. And the hippocampus goes, yep, got it, I'll remember that. And then it happens again and your amygdala goes, scared, hippocampus, I'll remember that. 
And so functional connectivity is actually maladaptive in this case. We don't want the hippocampus and the amygdala to be conspiring to remember this stuff. But what's happening in these exposed people to the earthquakes is that they've got increased functional connectivity where you don't want it. Unsurprisingly, this increased connectivity is related to their stress score. So the more stressed they were post-earthquake, the more of an increased connectivity they had in these two regions, which was causing maladaptive threat processing. So again, these are people that don't have any significant diagnoses. So to summarise that study, greater grey matter density in the prefrontal regions, lower in the frontoparietal regions. So these are all regions we need to modulate the limbic system and just to calm things down. You don't really want changes here. And then strengthened connectivity in the limbic system where again, we don't want changes because it's remembering something that you don't want it to remember as fearful. So if we look at these two studies together, post-earthquake, no significant diagnoses, the frontal cortex, is basically not doing what it should. It's not modulating the amygdala and hippocampus like we want it to. There's grey matter volume increases three and a half years later, again where we don't want them, in the frontal cortex, and there's also greater connectivity in the limbic system that we don't want. So after that cheery news, we thought, let's have a look if the same thing is happening in Christchurch. So the Neurological Foundation, after we went to them, said, we've got this really good idea. We're going to put these people that have already been through this horrible time, we're going to put them in a really small tube, we're going to make it really noisy, and then we're going to show them some horrible pictures. And they were like, what? <laughs> like, we just want to see what happens. We just want to see if their brain is OK after all of that. Shockingly, perhaps, the Neurological Foundation said, go for it. That seems like a great idea. So. We were very lucky that we were able to use the same participants that had been already involved in the Otago study. Very convenient because we already had quite a lot of data on them. We know their psychological profiles and we know how well they're doing on things like emotional processing. And they're already a really highly motivated group to help us out. I think out of the maybe 70 people I contacted, we only had five people that said no. And that was mainly because they had claustrophobia, so we let them off on that. So now we have this very convenient sample located in Christchurch who have been through the earthquakes, who don't have any major diagnoses. They've got lots of psychological data, lots of neuropsychological data, because we also tortured them with memory tests. And they wanted to get in the MRI machine. So this is what we call our resilient control group. So essentially, they were a control group for the post-traumatic stress disorder study. And now they're kind of our group that we're interested in, but they're still controls. So along with them, our Canterbury residents, we've got um, Dunedin residents because we needed people who haven't been through the earthquakes. This is actually surprisingly difficult in New Zealand because everybody knows somebody and you don't have actually had to have been living here to have been traumatised by the earthquake. You might have had a family member caught up in it. You might have had a family member end up living with you for several months. So we're also looking for Dunedin people who are unaffected by the earthquakes. We've actually still got 28 people to go, so if you know anyone in Dunedin that is prepared to go through that, we'd be very uh, interested in hearing from you afterwards. So our relatively complicated design is essentially boils down to a pile of people in Canterbury who had robust psychological um, data collected on them already. Our non-earthquake group in Dunedin who didn't experience the earthquake, who we've started doing the same psychological assessments on. And what our study is doing is putting the Canterbury people through an MRI scan and then the Dunedin people through an MRI scan. Now the problem with brain research is you can't actually move MRI machines between locations. So what we have is we have a whole lot of people being scanned here that are our experimental group essentially and a whole lot of people being scanned in Dunedin. What we really don't want to find is just that there's an effect of being scanned on two different machines. So we're also sending 12 of our Christchurch people to be scanned in Dunedin, 11 of whom have already done this. And we're sending 12 of our Dunedin people up here to be scanned just so we can compare and make sure that those 12 people, their brains are exactly the same in both places. 
So the psych assessment that everyone goes through includes the post-traumatic stress diagnostic scale and includes a resilience scale just to make sure that everyone is coping well and is currently coping well when we assess them. So everybody, I'm sure this will be very familiar to some of you, this is the MRI machine at St George's. So everybody comes in, lies down on the machine and we pop them in and collect a whole lot of data on their brains. What we're really interested in is the images task. So instead of showing people sad faces or happy faces, we're showing them a whole lot of images. Some of these images are absolutely horrendous. They're things like car accidents or burns victims or other horrible things. So these photos that we've used, um, thankfully I didn't have to sit down and just Google them and decide what was terrible and what wasn't. It's actually from a really well validated collection of pictures called the International Effective Picture System, which we call IAPS, because we're researchers, not linguistics champions. So we've got all these pictures and they have been rated on how good they are or how bad they are. So the bad images, the things like the car accidents, they're supposed to make your brain feel stress. And this has been well validated against control people with no other issues, so we know it works. And this is an example of what the brain looks like during this task. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. This is an example of what the brain looks like after we've done a lot of processing in maths and statistics to see what the brain looks like during the task. And in normal control... Sorry, in normal people with um, post-traumatic stress disorder, so not our... Canterbury people, but just the people it was validated against, you do see an amygdala response and you do see little bits and pieces going on in the sort of prefrontal regions. So we know the task elicits the stress response in post-traumatic stress disorder. So essentially, the experimental design was, please lie down, we're going to show you some pictures. About six of these pictures were horrible, and then six of them were okay. And then another six were really horrible and then six of them were okay, and this went on for 17 minutes. There was a wee break in the middle of maybe one minute. And what we were aiming for was to see what the brain did during the horrible images, and what the brain did during the not horrible images. I can tell you what the participants did during the horrible images, there was a lot of... And very gallantly, nobody actually moved. I was very impressed. It's quite a problem in MRI if people get a fright because they'll jump and then their brain's in the wrong place and we're collecting the wrong data. And unfortunately, I couldn't give them much of a warning about the images before we put them in. So again, I'm very sorry. Thank you for coming. I won't make you do anything else. So... This is a different example of what we see in people during this task. So this is a normal response. This is the occipital lobe, which is responsible for investigating visual data. So you'd expect your occipital lobe to be understanding the images. This is also the amygdala in the middle here, where you're seeing a little bit of response into the nasty images compared to the nice images. All so far, so normal. So overall, what you expect to see is an increased response here in the part responsible for looking at the vision of things, increased response in the amygdala because the images are nasty and if you're not eliciting a stress response it's a bit of a problem. You want an increased response in the memory centre, the hippocampus in here, and sometimes you'll see an increased response in the thalamus which is also involved in sort of memory and processing. So, what happened in Canterbury? We know that um, the control people have an increased response in the amygdala in response to the bad images. Hmm. I will show you that shortly. So because of all the previous research and all the research on the amygdala, we're expecting the amygdala to show quite a large response in relation to the nasty images. We expect that the brain is stressed and it'll show us this by showing increased activation. What we're additionally looking for is if this increased activation is much worse in Canterbury than it is in, for example, our Dunedin people. So if we see this, an increased amygdala response in Canterbury compared to our Dunedin people, we'll consider Canterbury people to have disrupted threat processing. And remember our Canterbury people are psychologically healthy. So where we're at with this is that we are part way through. So by this lecture, we were supposed to have finished. <laughs> <laughs>
but then COVID happened. In the middle of our nice, perfect stress in response to an earthquake project, we had another stressful event. So we've scanned all our Canterbury people pre-COVID, and we're halfway, almost halfway through scanning our Dunedin people post-COVID. So they'll be extra stressed. So this is our Canterbury people's brains. Now, because we don't have our control group, we don't know how bad this is yet. But this is the group average of all our people in Canterbury. And what we're looking at, this is our occipital lobe. So the Canterbury people can see the images. We're off to a good start. They can see the images. They're responding to the images. This is what we're really interested in, these little blobs right here. So the blue part is the amygdala, as defined by an atlas. This is the amygdala. The orange part is an increased response in the amygdala of the Canterbury people. So the Canterbury people are seeing the nasty images compared to the nice images, and they're having this response here, which remember is the disrupted threat processing system. Also a little bit going on in frontal regions. We can't conclude much from this yet. We still need our control group. We don't know whether this is significantly more in the amygdala compared to people who haven't been through the earthquakes. But we do know that the task is working in Canterbury people and that this is the normal response in when you see nasty images. So I guess stay tuned for part two is when we'll tell you whether this is a significant issue or not. So we have 28 people to scan left in Dunedin and once we've done that we'll be able to process their brains and do a comparison between Christchurch and Canterbury and we'll be able to tell you whether this blob is a problematic blob or just a blob. So to conclude, we know that Canterbury people have disrupted threat processing. We know that from the Otago study, the faces. We know other people who have been through earthquakes have brain changes and that these are in the threat processing regions that are also seen in post-traumatic stress disorder. We know from our own research that the stress task we're using is working. We're seeing the response in our Canterbury people that we expect. And so now we just need to decide whether this is problematic, which is the second stage of the research, which will be completed once we've got our control group. So one last pitch for if you know anyone in Dunedin between the age of 50-ish to 65-ish that would be willing to go through what you went through, we'd be really grateful to hear from you. But otherwise, huge thanks to the Neurological Foundation who have funded this project and have also extended the funding of this project to account for the COVID disruption. And the New Zealand Brain Research Institute, where I work, who hosts this project. And of course, to Pacific Radiology, where all our scans were done. But the most thanks has to go to our participants who have given up an enormous amount of time since the earthquakes to go through all these studies and then additionally got on a very loud, annoying MRI machine. So thank you.